It's no secret that motorists will be receiving an unwanted holiday gift from the OPEC nations this year in the form of higher gasoline prices. In a random survey of Montgomery gas stations, we found two which had raised their prices since closing last night. In Memphis, a public affairs spokesman for Exxon said the six cents a gallon price increase was due to rising material and operational costs. Another major factor is that the six dollar a barrel increase by Saudi Arabia and two other oil producers became retroactive to include gasoline sold after November 1st. OPEC nations are trying to reestablish a uniform pricing system but the continuing, apparently uncoordinated increases by some members makes the job very difficult. But all this means is a bleak outlook and rapidly rising gasoline prices, mainly because America is so dependent upon its oil imports. A new sense of frustration is appearing on the faces of motorists, different from the kind seen during the spring shortage. The prediction of $10 a gallon gasoline by the mid-1980s could become a reality, it wasn't that long ago that Americans laughed when officials said the 25 cents a gallon gas we used to buy would someday cost a dollar. Well, that day is here, and like it or not, we can either continue filling up and pay the price, or we'll have to find another way of getting around. Paul Roth, WSFA TV News. If you plan to do any traveling during the holidays, you probably won't run into any serious gasoline problems. In Alabama, I think supplies will be adequate. We're a little tight. Uh, we're about 9 or 10 percent short compared to the same period we were in 1978. But I think there will be adequate supplies because demand has gone down. And if the public will continue to obey the speed limit and cut out unnecessary trips, we should get by through the holidays okay. Well, I think supplies will remain tight, but I think that we won't have any serious problems in terms of being able to buy gasoline to make our holiday trips. Uh, earlier this week, we had some significant price increases due to the action taken by Saudi Arabia last week. Uh, that's pretty well been passed through now. AAA officials say their random spot check throughout the state indicates few service stations will be open Christmas Day. Their information also shows what motorists should expect to pay for the three grades of gasoline. For regular, full service, an average of $1.06. For unleaded, an average of $1.11. And for premium gasoline, an average of $1.12. Self-service prices may be several cents less per gallon. Throughout most of the state, there are lines forming, not waiting to see if motorists can get gasoline, but if they can get it at the cheapest price. Tomorrow, we'll take a look at what gas might cost in the next decade and what the alternatives are. Paul Roth, WSFA TV News. Up, up, and away. That's a good way to describe where fuel prices are heading. The world is slowly but surely running out of oil. Uh, we still have a great demand for oil. Uh, there really aren't any alternatives that we can switch to in the, in the near term, meaning the next 10 years. Uh, one of the Arab oil ministers predicted $10 a gallon gasoline by the end of, 19, of the 1980s. I don't know if that's true or not. But I think prices will have to rise, and, and I think we could be in some, for some very uh, serious supply problems in the next 10 years. There are a lot of oil ministers in the Organization of Petroleum Exporting Countries that believe that they should charge whatever the market will bear. And uh, at the rate oil prices have been increasing, if you look at the price increases just this year alone, counting the recently announced Saudi Arabian increases, uh, oil prices have gone up over 100 percent this year. And uh, if this continues, will be up to ten dollars a gallon fairly soon. Rapidly rising fuel prices will almost certainly affect the way we work, rest, and travel during the next ten years. In fact, if this week's prediction of ten dollar a gallon gas comes true, our entire society is likely to undergo dramatic and sweeping changes affecting just about every area of our lives. The alternatives? Conservation of what supplies are available, more efficient engines, and new energy sources. But the real key to the next decade for each of us is accepting that the days of cheap energy are over and learning to deal with a new way of life. Paul Roth, WSFA TV News. The blue team is filled with players from schools the few Southerners follow. For instance, real quick now, can you tell me Dartmouth's record last season? You might not know too much about the teams, but one look at the players practicing will tell you the blue squad is talented. The team has several players the Pro Scouts are interested in. Art Monk is a 6'2 wide receiver from Syracuse. His size and speed have drawn attention. 
Also at wide receiver is Kevin House from Southern Illinois. House runs a 4.3 40-yard dash and holds most of the Saluki receiving records. Throwing to those two talented gentlemen are a pair of quality quarterbacks, Eric Hoppel of Utah State and Bill Hurley of Syracuse. Hurley led the Orange Men to victory over McNeese State in the Independence Bowl. However, he's used to an option offense and is trying to adjust to a drop-back passing format. I come from this kind of offensive background, so it's new stuff to me. I, I believe it's new to our whole the whole team, and uh, it's, it's going to require a little bit of practice and getting to know each other before we can execute well. What kind of uh, what kind of uh, adjustments are you going to have to make? Well, I come from a school that's mostly a sprint out school and an option school, and we're, we're having a lot of drop back passes in the game, and uh, not as much option as maybe I'm used to. So I, you know, I just have to adjust to that. New formations may be difficult to learn, but Blue coaches say the team is making progress and will be ready to battle the gray on Christmas Day. And just for the record, the Big Green of Dartmouth had a 4-4-1 season. 138 prisoners were in the Montgomery County Jail last night. It has a maximum capacity of 120. Some of the inmates signed a petition demanding relief and submitted it to Judge Varner. Richard Shinbaum represents the inmates. He says Judge Varner ordered the excess inmates moved out by this afternoon. As attorney for the inmates in the Montgomery County Jail, are you satisfied with what the judge ordered today? I'm satisfied that the judge is going to bring the Montgomery County Jail back into compliance and is going to solve the problem. Alabama prison officials say they'll be able to absorb the excess inmates into state facilities. This is not a new problem. The 120 maximum figure has been exceeded before, and the case has been in federal court before. Over a month ago, Judge Varner ordered Sheriff Maxim Butler to keep the number of inmates below the maximum figure, but Sheriff Butler says he's got to keep all the inmates placed in his custody. Another of today's mandates from Judge Varner went to attorneys for the county. Varner told them to have concrete plans for solving the problem to him in 30 days. The county has already submitted one expansion plan, but it did not set any time frame. Even though the court order is against the Montgomery County Jail and Sheriff Maxim Butler, the real weight of the problem falls on the Montgomery County Commission because it'll be up to them to find the room to house those inmates on a permanent basis. Chris Grimshaw, WSFA TV News. For the twelfth time since the overcrowding problem has been before federal court, an injunction has been placed against the Montgomery County Jail. Today's injunction for state officials to help find space for 18 inmates, the excess number of inmates at the county jail. The jail is designed to hold 120 people, but there were 138 last night. Today's order came after Richard Schimbaum, attorney for the inmates, filed a motion with Judge Barner. As attorney for the inmates in the Montgomery County Jail. Are you satisfied with what the judge ordered today? I'm satisfied that the judge is going to bring the Montgomery County Jail back into compliance and is going to solve the problem. The 18 inmates were taken to Kilby Correctional Center just outside Montgomery for classification. Eventually they'll be moved to other state facilities. Judge Varner also told the attorney for the county that he wants more specific timetables for the county's plan to solve the overcrowding problem. The county has already filed an expansion plan, but it doesn't contain any time frame. The county has 30 days to file the additional information. That plan says the county intends to build a new jail. Even though the court order is against the Montgomery County Jail and Sheriff Maxim Butler, the real weight of the problem falls on the Montgomery County Commission because it'll be up to them to find the room to house those inmates on a permanent basis. Chris Grimshaw, WSFA TV News. That the judge will grant an order giving us the first step of what we have asked for, which is to bring these people into the federal court here with a governor's receiver and give us a chance to prove our case, which is that they are interfering with the governor's duties as receiver by filing the condemnation. So as this I- is, This is a major step forward for your this, side. This is very, uh, a major step and we're very pleased. The procedure for selecting municipal judges does not require public interviews by city council members, but Donald Watkins disapproves of the method of allowing the Montgomery Bar Association to conduct interviews and make recommendations on the applicants. Watkins says he wants personal interviews with all the candidates because he doesn't want the Bar Association doing what he describes as his job. Only six of the 13 applicants came for Watkins' interviews. I figure that if someone is sincerely interested in this position, they would uh, manifest that interest by showing up to one of the persons, to an interview with one of the persons who will ultimately be voting for 
uh, he or she. And uh, I can say at this time, as for Donald Watkins, he will not vote for anybody that didn't show the interest to, to uh, uh, come for his interview. One other councilman, Mark Gilmore, came to hear the interviews, but Watkins says he'll be glad to share his impressions of the applicants with any council member who wants his opinion. Lisa Nielsen, WSFA TV News. Over half of last month's price increase can be attributed to a sharp rise in housing costs. Housing prices rose 1.3 percent over the October index. The increase began in early October when the Federal Reserve Board tightened credit. The price of food and beverages rose six-tenths of one percent. Lisa Nielsen has a closer look at what that increase means for Alabamians. The State Farm Bureau's market basket survey shows prices have risen 2.9 percent since last month. 1979 prices in Alabama have gone up 10.5 percent over last year. That's lower than the national trend, but a Farm Bureau spokesman says the inflationary trend in Alabama probably will continue, even though January prices may drop briefly as they've done in the past. Leading the list of price increases are beef products. Poultry showed the lowest increase. Dairy products also remain relatively stable. The Farm Bureau spokesman says the scarcity of beef should have driven the prices higher, but the oversupply of pork and poultry have forced beef prices to remain competitively low. He also says that most of the price increases are not caused by farmers, but by hikes in the costs of fuel and labor. Lisa Nielsen, WSFA TV News. There were increases in other areas as well. The price of clothing and apparel is up two-tenths of one percent and remains the same as the October increase. Medical care is up nine-tenths of one percent compared to one percent in October and the price of gasoline is up corresponding with October's 1.7 percent increase. However, that amount is considerably lower than the 4 percent increases of earlier months. The only decline in prices seems to be in the area of household fuels, which dropped 1.3 percent. This marks the first drop in a year, and the Labor Department's report credits lower winter rates for electricity and natural gas for the decline. If prices continue to rise as they have in previous months, consumers will have paid 13 percent more in December than they paid in January. Economists say that would be the worst inflation since 1946 when World War II price controls were lifted. Cassandra Taylor, WSFA TV News. The motion to produce all of the requested evidence for the defense lasted less than a half hour. Defense attorney Walter Chandler is asking the state to reveal the name of its informant whose testimony concerning an illegal drug purchase led to a search warrant of the Danley home. During that search, hundreds of photographs were seized, which later led to six charges of child molestation against the Montgomery couple. Judge William Gordon reserved judgment on the defense motions. However, Chandler says he will ask for what's called a Franks hearing. The purpose of such a hearing is to challenge the validity of the state's informant. We intend to file, uh, prior to 5 o'clock today, a motion to suppress, a motion to quash the affidavit that was given in support of the search warrant, and a motion for a veracity hearing under Franks versus Delaware. The defense is also asking why no serialized bills were used in the drug buy, something Chandler says is standard procedure. Other defense requests for written and oral statements, as well as the right to view the confiscated marijuana, were granted. The trial date on the state charges has been set for January 22nd. The Danleys still face another two child molestation charges in district court on December 28th. Paul Roth, WSFA TV News. Well, I'm looking at uh, uh, some particular people, but uh, looking over the whole crop, and uh, you know, you've got a good group here. Uh, actually, this this game, as it turns out, this game put the top player in the in the draft out last year, and Otis Anderson. You know, he's a great player, and he had a good game down here. He did. Uh, I remember watching the the film. I didn't see the game, but I remember uh, he did just about everything in that one game that you'd want to run him back to do in this game last year. The interviews began promptly at 8.30, and one by one, the candidates spoke their views on what qualities are needed to fill the jobs of municipal judge and assistant judge. Other questions raised by the 11-member screening committee included the applicant's thoughts on the present judicial system, civic and bar association activities, continuing legal education, and whether a defendant's economic situation would sway the final judgment. 
The committee was asked by the Montgomery City Council to review the candidates in person. Our role is then, after the screening process is over, to take the applications, the letters and comments we've received from the public and from other lawyers, and uh, then take a vote, if you will, in our selection process and report back to the city again in accordance with the resolution passed by the city, selecting not, lo not more than five, or five where possible, as it says, to report to the city as being qualified for appointment to municipal judge, and five likewise for assistant municipal judge. Yesterday, Council Member Donald Watkins held his own interviews with six candidates. However, Watkins says the screening committee is illegal because they're doing the council's job. Watkins was not there during the committee's interviews. However, several other council members were. Chairman Walter Byer says it's up to the committee to determine if it wants its recommendations made public before the city council sees them. And as of late this afternoon, there was no word on who might receive the committee's endorsement. Paul Roth. WSFA TV News. Alabama is in its second day of formal preparation for its Sugar Bowl date with Arkansas. They began yesterday. They've been running, of course, uh, for the last uh, few days, keeping in shape. At his news conference this morning, a couple of uh, items of interest. Coach Bryant revealed that Stedman Sheely re-injured that tender right knee last week, but that the injury has come around and uh, his knee appears no longer a problem. So Tide fans will breathe a sigh of relief with that note. On another matter, he revealed that Alabama will not be going to Japan to play Georgia Tech the opening game next year, as has been reported widely in the state. We worked a long time getting the Tech game back on the schedule, and an awful lot of our people have had difficulty in getting tickets to games, and uh, I don't feel like we'd be treating them right if. Uh, if we move the game to Tokyo, and and I'm not sure that we could anyway, but I'm just saying that that recommendation will not be made because it's our home game, and uh, we're going to recommend we played in Birmingham. The fire started in the north wing. It was reported by a neighbor. The church has an alarm system, but fire officials say it didn't go off. Six trucks were sent to the scene. At the same time, one fire truck was sent to a false alarm at the Southeast Alabama Medical Center. Fire Chief Ray Barnes says the fire sensors at the medical center are overly sensitive. He says these types of alarms are not as frequent as they used to be. As soon as firemen discovered the alarm was false, they went to the church. When firemen arrived, the church was well involved in flames. The fire spread throughout the educational building and into the sanctuary. It damaged a $175,000 pipe organ, which the church bought a year ago. The 65-foot steeple and chimes were also burned. It took fire officials almost three hours to extinguish the blaze. The church pastor, Dr. George Gilbert, estimates the damage at one to three million dollars and says it will be six months to a year before the church can be reopened. Dr. Gilbert says he has received a great deal of support from ministers of other churches. He names several possibilities for places to have service, but says his main concern is a place to house the Sunday school and nursery school programs. We have about 525 people average in Sunday school each Sunday, and it's not easy to find a place to house that group in a close proximity to the worship service, and that's our concern right now. So we have not nailed down anything yet for next Sunday. Church members were able to save much of the office equipment. It's now being stored here in the old parsonage. 
Earlier today, phone service was restored and the building will be used as a temporary office. Ordinarily, the members of this church celebrate Christmas by having two candlelight services on Christmas Eve. And tonight won't be any exception because the members of the First Baptist Church have asked First United Methodist members to celebrate there. Cassandra Taylor, WSFA TV News in Dothan. The Alabama Department of Public Health has some cooking tips to make Christmas a merrier and safer holiday. Tips about treats you're probably serving this season, and particularly a meat item that's popular this time of year. Turkey should be thawed in the refrigerator, never at room temperature. And if it's large, it could take two or three days to thaw, so be sure to plan ahead. Before handling the turkey, wash your hands thoroughly to avoid contaminating the bird with bacteria. If you're going to put stuffing in the bird, do it just before popping the turkey in the oven. And as soon as the turkey is cooked, remove the stuffing. The public health department says if the turkey's a large one, it might be safer to cook the stuffing separately. Also, it says, regardless of what we've been told in the past, the only certain way to tell when the turkey's done is by putting a meat thermometer in the thickest part of the thigh or the breast to see if it registers between 180 and 185 degrees. Another tip for when you're finished eating, never allow food to remain at room temperature. Christmas goodies and other food should be placed in the refrigerator immediately to minimize the chance of bacteria growth. As for pies and other such confections, they can be kept at room temperature for a full day. But once you slice it, you need to put it in the refrigerator. If you'll follow these simple rules, you'll be on the way to a happier and safer Christmas dinner. Ivy Berman, WSFA TV News. During this uh, time he was in the store, a scuffle between he and one of the managers occurred. And during the scuffle, he was shot once in the head with a handgun. Uh, approximately 12.30 this morning, Brown died at Jackson's Hospital. Any idea where the case will go now? The case is still in investigation. It will terminate at the grand jury. Uh, all death cases are presented to the Montgomery County Grand Jury for uh, any type of indictment or no bill. Coach, you have uh, explained to uh, Joe here that you'll be around after he's gone and that uh, he ought to take it easy on you. But have well, you the thing I've tried to emphasize, Coach Rustic, is that uh, I live close by here and, uh, you know, 50 miles, and, and people see us all the time. And, and uh, certainly uh, we'd appreciate him, you know, kind of being benevolent to us uh, anyhow and uh, not, not running it up on us. I'm sure he's going to do that for you, too. Coach, how has the uh, pass, the, the throwing and catching been for you this week? I think we have a great group of receivers, no doubt about it. And we have two fine quarterbacks, and I feel going in, we have to capitalize on that part of our game to move the football. I just hope it's a dry day and we have an exciting game. That's the big thing. How about uh, protection? You won't know, I guess, until you, you get the game. You won't know until you get on the field game day. And uh, I know they have some outstanding talent over there. And uh, Coach Barfield has talked about those people all week. and. And I know he, uh, he just <laughs> seems to uh, give uh, us the feeling that uh, they're going to be tough to beat, and uh, I know they will, and I just hope it's a very exciting ball game and a high-scoring game. I think that will have great fan appeal. 
Thank you, Coach. How about that uh, talent you've been telling them about, Coach? Well, we're, we're real proud of our, uh, our group. Uh, they all want to be here, and uh, uh -huh. I think that's a plus for the game. Really, I've been impressed with that uh, uh, all week. That the guys have been willing. They've done everything we've asked them to do. They've been on time, and, and they, they've been interested, and I think they'll play hard, and I think they want to do a good job for the blue-gray, and uh, I just, I'm like Joe. I hope it's an exciting game, and Somebody said, well, 35 to 34. I said, either way, you know, I think that'll be great uh, if we move the ball and, and, and score some points, hopefully. Looks like it's going to be good weather, and I hope we have a good crowd. Merry Christmas, gentlemen. Thank you for coming here to uh, help us with the blue-gray, and we hope you see a lot of folks tomorrow. Thank you very Thank much. Thank you, Phil. The new jail construction is a result of a federal court suit filed against Houston County. Following the suit, county officials signed a consent decree which promised great changes. Today, some of those changes can be seen rising out of the ground next to the existing jail facility. The multi-million dollar jail will contain the latest in security and correctional equipment. Original cost estimates were high, and county officials were forced to rethink their plans and come up with an alternate design. In addition, parking around the courthouse and jail had to be considered during construction. A protective barrier was built on the street side of the construction to keep the debris off of passers-by. Originally, there were blank white panels. Now most of these panels are covered with some rather well-done artwork. The paintings range from fantasy and space to the symbol of the Dothan area itself, the peanut. Here, a peanut tower is depicted, and next to it, more peanut propaganda. Houston County officials have spent many hours on the jail project, and no doubt they will be proud when the facility is dedicated. Houston County Commission Chairman Charles Whidden says since federal judge Frank M. Johnson Jr. played such a big part in the new jail, he may be asked to come and cut the ribbon himself. Dennis Latham, WSFA-TV News, Dothan. See lots of toys and surprises tonight. Oh, yeah. Are you nervous about tonight's trip? Oh, no, I look forward to this. This is the one night a year I look forward to. Will Dancer and Prancer and the other reindeer have any problems? No, 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 I keep them in shape all year long. This is the one night they look forward to. They practice every night, but tonight's the night. Are you worried about the weather? <laughs> no, 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 Mrs. Claus made this nice big suit to keep warm in. Do you have a lot of presents to give out tonight? Oh, oh I've got presents for all the children. They've, they've all been good this year. I've ch checked my list twice. They've all been real good. And what about next Christmas? Oh, I, I've already started on my presents for the next couple of years. And I've got lists. I'm starting. I ain't checked them twice yet, though.
This has been a very special week of practice for Charlie Trotman. He is preparing for his last football game. In all likelihood, tomorrow's blue-gray game will be Trotman's farewell to football, certainly his last appearance in the Crampton Bowl. The blue-gray game and the Crampton Bowl hold very special memories for Charlie. He's been closely associated with each throughout his life, and there'll be some bittersweet memories when he pulls on the pads for the last time. The bowl was, was special to me. At Jeff Davis, we played all the home games there, and, and uh, you know, I've had, I got a lot of fond memories of uh, Crampton Bowl, and, and I hope this will be one of them. What do you think your thoughts will be as you pull on the pads for the last time? Well, I, that will be one of my thoughts. Will this or will this not be one of the last times or the last time that I put on pads? That'll be one of them. And, and you know, just to do my best to, to, uh, to do well in front of my family and, and all my friends that are here in Montgomery. Trotman's only chance at a professional football career is to be drafted as a defensive back. Toward that end, he will play a good deal in the secondary tomorrow. But for many of us, Charlie Trotman, number six, will always be the quarterback, leading the volunteers our War Eagles to victory. Is there anything you want to say to people in Montgomery and surrounding area? They followed you all through high school at JD and then up at Auburn with the War Eagles. Well, just that uh, they all stayed behind me no matter what I did at Auburn. And uh, I got so many letters and, and so many warm wishes from, uh, from friends and, and family that, that uh, I can only tell them thank you. And, and I, I really do appreciate it because they stayed behind me uh, when a lot of other people really weren't behind me. Wondering about gas prices going up? Forget about it for today because few service stations across the southeast are open. According to a survey conducted by the American Automobile Association, only 25% of the stations are pumping gas. In Alabama, the percentage is estimated at close to or below 10%. And officials are quick to point out that the stations open may cost a few cents more per gallon at the pump. As for the last week of 1979 and the first one of 1980, AAA says supplies will be adequate and prices relatively stable. However, only 48% of the stations throughout the southeast are expected to be open for business during the New Year's holiday next week. Paul Roth, WSFA TV News. More than 1979 years ago today, a baby boy was born unto Mary and Joseph of Nazareth, those of the Christian faith believe he was the Son of God, conceived through immaculate conception, the Messiah who gave his life out of love for his fellow man. What does Christmas truly mean? Whenever a nation or a world is in a posture of trouble, uh, the significance of Christ is a stabilizing force. When, 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 when other factors are, such as your economy is fluctuating and people are, are trying to maintain some type of stability, uh, the fact that Christ never changes uh, tends to give them something that's stable and that they can always depend on. Well, it's a very special day for Catholics. It commemorates one of the central teachings of our faith, which we call the Incarnation, God becoming man in the person of Jesus Christ. He came out of obedience and love for his Father and for us, and he showed that love in the culmination of his life when he ended it by dying for us. And no uh, greater love than that, no one has. Thousands of years after his crucifixion, Jesus Christ is worshipped for his sacrifice and his teachings, primarily for his humility and brotherly love, a lesson still being taught today throughout the world. Paul Roth, WSFA TV News. was the day before Christmas and all through the town, Santa and his helpers were traveling around. After months of donations, asking and calls, Montgomery's Youth Aid Division would give it their all. This morning at sunrise, while the children still slept, the police and their friends quietly packed the presents they kept. The toys and food given by residents in an expression of good cheer would ensure those without of a happy new year. Once loaded and wrapped and well on their way, Santa arrived to make this a very special day. At each stop he made with armfuls of presents, it became clear to see the holiday essence. The eyes wide open, the mouth agape. Parents and children said the miracle was great. There were things for the Millwoods who last week saw their home catch on fire and now try to rebuild their lives and spirits higher. 
At the home of the Thompsons, Ruthie Mae, Jimmy, and Kenny, an empty Christmas turned into one of plenty. And for the Browns and their special family of seven, a holiday they say was made in heaven. The smiles and the tears from those who have not are summed up best by this special thought. I just think it's going to be a beautiful Christmas because there's, there's so much stuff and we're happy. Paul Roth, WSFA TV News. The local radio station, WHHY, and the Community Relations Division of the Montgomery Police Department estimate more than 4,000 residents attended the annual event. Lines stretched outside Garrett Coliseum, waiting for a traditional Christmas dinner, complete with all the trimmings. According to the director of the Community Relations Bureau, Lieutenant John Anderson, a large segment of the community worked very hard to make this Christmas dinner a success. The Parks and Recreation Department offered transportation to and from the Coliseum, while all of the cooks gave of their time and expertise. Anderson says tickets for the free meal were offered to anyone who considered themselves underprivileged or unable to have what many would consider a Merry Christmas. However, once inside, the crowd became anxious for its free gifts, and police, members of the Marine Corps Reserve, and ROTC had to lend a hand. We saw several instances where children received more than one gift, causing many others to be left empty-handed, obviously not in keeping with the spirit of the day. Mayor Emery Falmer and others emphasized the good of the day's event, but Ed today taught them a lesson. Oh, we'll probably try to uh, have a little more, uh, uh, many more presents because everybody wants more than one, but uh, that's the best we could do this year, but I think everybody's had a super good time. As for next year, Lieutenant Anderson says he'd like to be able to offer 10,000 residents a special holiday dinner and hopes to begin work on the Christmas feast two months ahead of time. Paul Roth, WSFA TV News. The men at fire station number three probably expect you to spend Christmas Day much like any other day around the firehouse, waiting to answer the next call. That is, until members of the Sigma Phi Epsilon fraternity from Auburn University of Montgomery showed up with turkey, dressing, and all the Christmas dinner trimmings. Over a dozen of the brothers and little sisters filed into the firehouse with the goodies, singing as they went. Once inside, the firemen wasted no time in breaking out the dishes and silverware to enjoy the feast. They were even treated to some more music from their visitors. Ralph Weatherall says they got the idea to bring Christmas dinner to the firemen several years ago. Well, a couple of years ago, one of the brothers who worked in Superfoods, uh, plug for Superfoods there, uh, saw some firefighters come in on Christmas Day and buy some luncheon meat. And we decided it would be more in tune to the Christmas spirit to fix them, you know, a nice turkey dinner and everything. The men of Fire Station Number 3 came on duty at 8 this morning and will stay for 24 hours. The turkey and trimmings will help them pass the time in style. For the members of Sigma Phi Epsilon, the day has just begun. There are many more fire stations in the city to be visited and many, many more firemen to be fed. Dennis Latham, WSFA-TV News. Most of the department store managers I talked to today said very few people came in for exchanges and refunds. Of those who did, over half made exchanges to get the right sizes. The men's department characteristically has the longest lines, but here at Montgomery Wards, there is no line. The lingerie department is another, with a line usually much longer than this. According to Montgomery Ward's assistant manager, Marty Maston, most of the store shoppers were there for the sales. Uh, the first people that came charging in were people who were buying merchandise instead of returning. Of course, as the day progresses, I'm sure we'll get uh, more returns in, and as the week we hit the weekend, it'll, it'll really be big for us, I'm sure. Sales and returns, maybe, unfortunately. Since today is just the first day for exchanges, store managers say chances are many more people will be coming in later on this week, and especially this weekend. But who knows? Maybe most people got what they really wanted for Christmas. Cassandra Taylor, WSFA TV News. This year, Alabama Power Company has had a 22% increase, and Alabama Gas increased their rates 35%. Because of this, local fireplace distributors say more and more people are turning to fireplaces to heat their homes. Fireplace sales are in full swing. 
Distributors say the increase began in late August, and they don't anticipate any decline until March. However, not all fireplaces are energy efficient. Which fireplace has a 10 percent efficiency, and if the fireplace is left open, the damper is left open at night, it may even become a negative efficiency. Uh, the efficiency can be improved on fireplaces by putting glass doors or bringing outside air for combustion. You can also purchase a wood burning stove, which the efficiency on wood burning stoves is somewhere in the neighborhood to 50 to 60 percent. Stanford says those who use wood burning stoves as their primary source of heat may use it as a federal tax credit or an income tax deduction. Even though you may not want to pay the money for a wood burning stove, you can still have a fire. Local distributors say this basic built-in model is their best seller. People who buy this type of fireplace are more concerned with its aesthetic beauty and the way it extends to their home. Cassandra Taylor, WSFA TV News. Walter Byers is the chairman of the Montgomery County Bar Association Committee, which screened the applicants December 22nd. Today's announcement of the committee's recommendation was done in alphabetical order. Jerry L. Cruz, Charles P. Hollisfield, John Thomas Kirk, and Curtis Lee Springer. The review of the dozen applicants was done by the committee at the request of the council. The committee also made recommendations for the assistant municipal judgeship position. Jerry L. Cruz, Wendell R. Morgan, Charles Price, Randolph P. Reeves, and Curtis A. Spring. In addition to the council's attempt to review the applicants, Councilman Donald Watkins is also conducting a personal review of those applicants. Watkins is also conducting a personal investigation of a November shooting incident in which a Montgomery woman was shot in the face by a police officer. Before the meeting, Watkins talked to us about his circuit court suit, which will try to get the courts to make Montgomery Mayor Emery Fulmer hand over that officer's personnel file. I asked him if he thought this suit would set a precedent. I think it is. For the first time, we will have some definitive answer on the role and scope of individual council members. How about the privacy of the officer's record? Well, I have researched the Privacy Act together with the attorney who's representing me, uh, Attorney Durant, and we're convinced that there is no violation of the Privacy Act covering uh, this particular personnel file. During Mayor Fulmer's message to the council, he reaffirmed his stand that as a council, the group may see the personnel file, but individually, no council member can have access to them. In the meantime, Mr. Mitchell, Officer Mitchell's personnel file will be available only when the highest court in the state of Alabama orders me to deliver. The only other subject in the mayor's message concerned cut back city services because of the holiday season, but Fulmer says after the new year rolls around, things will be back to normal. Chris Grimshaw, WSFA TV News. This NOAA satellite, which remains in a position about 22,000 miles above a point on the equator, provides the primary vantage point in space for the scientists observing and forecasting solar activity. The Space Environment Services Center in Boulder receives from this satellite measurements of short-term variations of the sun through sensors monitoring the star's X-rays and the ceaseless but irregular flow of charged atomic particles referred to as the solar wind. Specially filtered telescopes and other sophisticated equipment aid the center in warning of disruptions in communication services, magnetic surveys, power and long lines telephone systems, and other technologies easily affected by the energetic showers and magnetic storms the Earth receives from the sun. Just as important to the sun watchers are its long-term variations. First of all, it produces sunspots that, that rise in number and in size and cover the surface of the sun over periods of about an 11 year cycle so that at the minimum of the cycle there are, there are no spots in the sun for days at a time and at the maximum of the cycle uh, there can be hundreds of spots on the sun at one time. Like the short-term changes on the sun such as flares and magnetic storms the long-term variations directly affect human activities. Part of the 11 year variation is a heating of the upper atmosphere of the earth. This means that there's more drag, more effect on satellites in orbit there. Satellites don't last as long. They come down sooner than expected. Navigation satellites uh, change their positions more rapidly. They don't show up where they're expected to be. So there are problems in terms of navigation systems. 
Do sunspots affect our weather? Few scientists think our daily local weather conditions are influenced in any important ways, but there are clues that even small changes in the sun's energy output, if they persist for quite some time, could alter the long-term weather trends we call climate. At the heart of the latest research is this graphed curve joining the 11-year peaks of annual sunspot numbers. Solar physicists believe something fundamental in the sun may be amplifying or modulating the sunspot cycle, just as voice and music modulate an AM radio carrier. A striking example of the possible effect of this modulation on Earth's climate is found in records of diminished solar activity back in the 17th century. For a period of 70 years, sunspots were few and far between. At the same time, the Earth was going through what has been labeled the Little Ice Age, with temperatures the coldest of the last thousand years. I'm Dan Atkinson with Weatherbeat. From May to September of this year, five Alabama counties participated in a food stamp mail-out trial program. In Montgomery County, some recipients called in saying they hadn't received their stamps, when in fact they had. Of the $3,972,000 in stamps mailed out in Montgomery County, more than 700 replacement allotments were made, totaling more than $105,000. However, despite the problems in Montgomery County, Pensions and Securities has decided to go ahead with the mail-out statewide, but with a few exceptions. Well, of course, we think that the mail-out program is a success because uh, it's much more convenient for the recipient. It cuts down on the lines. It also, in terms of efficiency of management, it's an improvement with, within the department. We plan to expand the program statewide to uh, all of the rural, smaller counties. We're not going to move into the other urban counties until we get a better handle on how to reduce the loss. Jennings says the department is already working to uncover which recipients obtained more than their fair share of food stamps. Paul Roth, WSFA TV News. One of the most popular con games with Flim Flam artists this time of year is the pigeon drop. And they will have a second subject who will come up claiming to have found an envelope containing what they don't know. Well, somehow they'll get it around to the talk of, of opening up the envelope. They'll open up the envelope and they'll display a small amount of cash, or a large amount of cash, but it looks like a large amount of cash, to the victim. And the victim will, of course, see the money that's involved in the envelope. Then a third person will come up and say that they seen, they know where they can get rid of this money, or they know what they can do with it. So what, and all the time that they're doing this, they're gaining the victim's confidence as far as him putting up money. They're talking to him, you know, like they'd be willing to share it with him if he could put up some type of faith money. And uh, what they will normally do is they'll send one of the subjects, he'll go, he'll make up a pretense like he's going to go talk to his boss and see just exactly what they can do with it. And he'll leave the area for a few minutes and then he will come back and he'll say that his boss opened up the envelope and found it contained maybe $25,000. And that this boss is able to get rid of it and give them a reward for finding the money and everything like this. And they said that they'd be willing to share the reward with this person if he could put up some type of faith money because they're trusting him, he should be able to put up some money to show that, that he can trust them. So normally what they'll ask him to do is either go to his bank and get his savings out of the savings account or they'll ask him to put up some type of jewelry or something like this in order to put up his faith money. Well, when the victim has gotten this money together, they will say that they want to have a third party hold the money, one that they both know and everything like this because he was there. And in the process of this change in the hands and everything like this, and then they'll say, well, you know, if you don't trust us, we'll let you hold the money. Well, what they do at that particular time, the envelope that the victim brought up with the money and the envelope that they had is switched. Now, he's got the victim ends up holding a bag full of paper, cut paper, and they've switched his envelope and got it, and they just walk away. Uh, 
Detective J.M. Duncan says there are ways to avoid being conned. Say there's only one basic rule, and that would be that no one's going to give you anything for free. And that if anyone approaches you with a, a, such a program as that, I would be skeptical of it. Because you're not going to get anything for nothing. You're going to end up paying for it. And if the uh, deal appears to be too good, then I would immediately suspect something to be wrong with it. So far this season, at least one elderly Montgomery couple has been flim flammed out of several thousand dollars by confidence men using the pigeon drop scheme. This is Norman Lumpkin, WSFA TV News reporting. South Carolina quarterback Gary Harper can be a little choosy in his play calling. Harper has the option of keeping the ball, handing off, or throwing. Six of his tosses have been for touchdowns. This one's complete to Ben Cornett. When Harper hands off, it's usually to George Rogers. He is the key to the Gamecock offense. He's big, strong, and explosive. Rogers gained more than 1,500 yards rushing this season. That's second only to Heisman Trophy winner Charles White. Missouri will have the tough task of stopping Mr. Rogers. Quarterback Phil Bradley is the heartbeat of the Missouri Tigers. He is a first team all Big 8 selection. Bradley directs the Tigers' veer offense and quite often keeps the ball himself with positive results. Just to keep defenses honest, Bradley will often turn to an aerial attack. He's thrown five touchdown passes this year, Andy Gibbler on the receiving end of this toss. The Tigers also feature two outstanding running backs, James Wilder and Jerry Ellis. Both are big bruising runners that are hard to bring down. Missouri has suffered a roller coaster 6-5 and five season this year. The Tigers will need to be at a seasonal peak to score a victory over South Carolina in the Hall of Fame Bowl. Fred Albers, WSFA TV Sports. The state's accidental death toll due to traffic accidents was lower than projected for the Christmas holiday counting period. Coming up, however, is the equally dangerous New Year's holiday period. Sergeant Robert Applin of the Alabama State Troopers says, as usual, they will be looking out for speeders and drunk drivers. We're estimating for the New Year's holiday period a loss of 12 citizens in this state uh, through traffic accidents, of course. Over the Christmas holidays, we lost nine. We felt very fortunate ending up with a figure this low. And uh, I'm afraid this time it's going to be higher this New Year's holiday period. What is the Department of Public Safety doing as far as extra enforcement, extra watching out for the guy who's had a little bit too much to drink? Well, we're going to work pretty much as we did over the Christmas holidays. Our troopers are concentrating on the drunk drivers, on the high-speed drivers, and again on those that fail to yield right away. This is the three things that's killing our people off. Aside from the Department of Public Safety, what can the safety conscious member of the public do to lessen his or her chances of being involved in an accident or being involved as a fatality? Well, the old adage, friends don't let friends drink and drive. But the main thing is, Dennis, each one of us can watch out for that other driver. No one likes to receive a traffic ticket, especially during the holidays. But remember, the trooper who is giving you that ticket might also be saving your life or that of someone you love. Dennis Latham, WSFA-TV News. Only thing I can recognize down there is my foot. Oh, you see. And my part of my leg. That's all I have to show for it. You're buried in about you three could, feet of humanity there. Right. right? A lot of body. <laughs> and the fun thing about it is I didn't even know what was going on, you know. I knew, you know, we were about six inches from the goal line. 
And the end zone was kind of like split, one south, Alabama, one south, Penn State. And all I could hear was just a little background noise coming through the body, you know, the bodies there. I couldn't hear too much of it, but I, I, while I was laying there and everybody was going to say, well, if they scored, I'll be hearing cheers. And if we stop them, I'll be hearing cheers. So I'll just find out when I get out from up under all of this. <laughs> And it was something else. And I got up and I saw Barry flat out as usual laying there, good old pinched nerve. And uh, I looked up at the scoreboard at the far end, and it, my eye just started beaming. I was so overjoyed. <laughs> and you didn't see any numbers up there? Didn't see any numbers up there, huh? Well, you, really, uh, uh, your job was to get under everybody, right? Yes, sir. So it was. you really didn't know what happened. You were that, just doing All I had to do there. was get up under him and go far back, far back the other direction as I could. And then Krauss got all the glory for, for making the tackle, right? Yeah, Krauss, a lot of us, you know. <laughs> we, all, we all chipped in. I don't care who gets the credit just as long as he didn't score. They ought to put a little tag down there and says, this foot belongs to number 47. I've been autographing a lot of posters that says, this is my leg. <laughs> and that's all I have to show for it. On October 23rd of this year, Bullock County Circuit Judge Jack Wallace ordered the state of Alabama to collect the performance bond of Bullock County Tax Assessor James Carter. Now more than two months later, the State Finance Department has filed this suit in Montgomery County Circuit Court to recover that money. The suit says the state has suffered irreparable damages because Carter has failed to carry out his duties as tax assessor in Bullock County. The three companies involved are American States Insurance, American Fire and Casualty Company, and Aetna Casualty and Surety Company. Has the state exercised all of its non-legal options in this situation? We have uh, uh, had considerable uh, discussions with the various parties involved, with the surety companies. We have sent demand letters. Uh, we feel that this is uh, the only recourse left open to us, and certainly we feel that uh, we have given every opportunity for the companies to comply with our request for payment on their bonds, and, and in our opinion, this is the only uh, avenue left available to us. If this suit is successful, then Bullock County Tax Assessor James Carter will lose his $50,000 bond. He'll have to secure another, and if he cannot, then he'll have to vacate his office. Dennis Latham, WSFA-TV News at the Capitol. These sensors here will Many people find it hard to relax. Biofeedback is a term used for a machine that measures several bodily functions. Responses such as muscle tension, heart rate, and skin temperature are converted into a sound that the patient can hear. The lower the pitch and frequency of the sound, the more relaxed the patient. You've probably noticed that any time you're feeling tense or anxious, a number of physical things can happen. You might notice that your heart is beating rapidly, your hands may feel cold and sweaty, you may feel tense. If you can learn to control these physical reactions in the face of a stressor, then you're going to be able to relax better, you're going to take it out on yourself physically much less if you have control over these responses. And that's essentially what we're trying to teach people to do with uh, biofeedback. Tension headaches, for instance, have long been extremely hard to treat with medication. But many people are now learning to control their headaches and tension through biofeedback techniques. This is Carl Valker reporting from Auburn. Most teens wouldn't dream of spending their Christmas vacation under intense inspection by an Air Force general, no less. But for these Civil Air Patrol cadets, the chance to compete in the national competition was one of their Christmas wishes come true. These teams were the survivors of a series of local and statewide eliminations and represent the best in CAP's eight national regions. Today's marching drills were just the first part of the two-day competition. The spit and polish shoes, clenched fists, and expressionless faces characterized the intense concentration of the cadets as they executed series after series of intricate marching. This is defending champion North Carolina's eighth year in the competition. They would like very much to win it again. But each year the competition gets better as well as more demanding. According to North Carolina team captain Hugh Carter, just having the chance to compete is the biggest honor. You feel proud, pride in your unit. You know, come down here and try to show it off to other people and show the rest of CAP what you're about. 
Carter says he always worries about making a mistake, but the thought of it doesn't change his team's strategy. He just tells them to do their best. Sydney Kohara, WSFA TV News. Miss Alice Crew started work with the prison system in 1933 as a stenographer. Since that time, she has served 15 prison commissioners or directors. She will retire on December 31st. Today, many paid tribute to her hard work. Joining Miss Crew was her sister, Mrs. Marion Lynch, and another longtime state employee, Miss Kate Simmons. Miss Kate has worked in the governor's office for 50 years, and she'll retire next month. Prison Commissioner Robert Britton presented Miss Crew with a proclamation from Montgomery Mayor Emery Farmer, which made today Miss Alice Crew Day. Britton also read a certificate of appreciation from Governor Fob James. Another who honored Miss Crew was former prison commissioner Frank Lee, who recalled some fond memories and many of the people who have worked with Miss Crew. Highlighting the ceremony was a presentation of a new color television set to Miss Crew. She promptly invited her two companions over to watch TV this Sunday. Miss Crew says all of her years with the prison system were enjoyable, and she says there have been many changes. You, you grow, you have to progress with time. If you don't do that, you kind of lost it. And these changed, most of them, I see each one. Most of them have always been for the better. Something good has come of all the changes. And uh, in the past few years, there have been quite a number of changes, and all seem to be for the better. As far as her plans after retirement, Miss Crew says she'll stay at home and watch television, at least for a while. Dennis Latham, WSFA-TV News.